Hi. Okay, so the aim is to build a wind turbine of at least one kilowatt hour for less than a hundred pounds. And I want to build a turbine that hopefully will do more, but at least that, uh, last three years and stick it on my roof and test it. So that's what I'm going to do. Now for less than a hundred pounds, obviously quite a lot of it is going to be salvaged and um, collected from various places. If I buy something, I'll include that and I'll include the cost of the magnets. Not the coils, because I plan on using microwave oven coils, so I don't think I ought to be including those. But certainly anything I spend, I'm going to include. Anything I find and use, I'm not going to include, because it's basically just scrap. And I want to take that scrap and turn it into a very usable wind turbine that will generate some serious power. And that's the challenge I've kind of set myself. So, let's get on with it. In the previous videos, what we've been doing is a um, horizontal or vertical axle wind turbine. Now. The way we've been making them with the magnets on the outside of the rim there, to my mind, has given really impressive results. The last one we made obviously was made from a cable drum, and to be honest, it was scrap wood and it was nailed and glued together, so it wobbled like crazy, but even despite that, we got a good result out of it. Now, guess what that immediately tells me is make a better version, one that's more stable, one that's stronger, one that's going to last longer, something like that. The traditional way that people make blades for wind turbines on the YouTube and the uh, do-it-yourself is with a bit of pipe. Now a bit of pipe actually is a bit of a pain to handle because it's quite springy. However, I came across this stuff. This is rainwater gutter that is actually the same size as the bit of pipe. So that bit of pipe usually is 110. This is 112 actually, so it's pretty much the same size. But it has the added advantage of being flat. So we can cut that and we can saw that into blade shapes, no worries at all, without the same problems that you tend to have when trying to cut a pipe up. So this rainwater gutter is what I've chosen to use, so same size as pipe. Oddly enough, it's actually the same price as well. So clearly there's some time of kind of material cost, some time of machining cost. It's the same price for two of these as it is for one pipe. So I've got the same amount of material and it is much more handleable. So my first job is to make a whole load of blades out of this stuff just by chopping it in half, slicing it down and finishing it off. So let's do that. I'm about to cut all those blades out from this pipe. Now we're people, so whenever we do anything a whole load of times, actually your mind drifts a bit and um, you never get things exactly right, even if you measure up and cut. It's the way it is. So the easiest thing to do is just make a very rough jig. And that's all I've done. What I've done is I've bolted a bit of wood onto the bench there. So that when I shove my pipe up against that bit of wood, because my saw's in the same place, they're going to be the same length. I can't do anything about it. So I measured that up to the um, 60 centimetres, actually. And now every piece that I cut is going to be the same length. Now I'm using this thing, uh, and I should tell you, I'm not being paid to advertise this. This is an Evolution saw that I use. It's a basic chop saw. It cost me uh, 90 quid actually, 95 quid, something like that. It slides back and forwards. It's got a 45 tilt that way, that way. The table will tilt around to 45 degrees. So nice basic saw. Does the job really well, but it's the blade really. This blade is called a, an Evolution Rage blade, and it cuts through plastic, wood, uh, aluminium, steel, it's, uh, I've used it for a ton of stuff and I find it a really useful saw. So if you haven't got one of these, you haven't got a chop saw, you probably couldn't do much worse than that, I suppose. Anyway, all I have to do now is chop those out. So once you've done that, you cut them all to size, uh, just mark them up. I mean, all I did was wrap a piece of string around there, measure the string, divide the string by three, wrap it back around and transfer the marks, join them up, and I got myself three blades. Now, obviously, we need to cut that up. I use this, actually, which is a Stanley Fat Max uh, reciprocating cutter. It's something I have that I think is an awesome tool for this kind of job, but I mean a handsaw, a knife, an angle grinder, I've seen loads of ways of cutting these. You basically need to cut it into three slats, and that's what you get when you cut it into three slats. Now obviously we've got a bit of a rough edge, which is right there, so we need to clean that edge up. Now there is a tool called a cabinet scraper, which is basically a bit of steel with a hook blade on it. I actually tend to use these box cutter knife blades or trimming knife blades. Now, they're a very sharp blade, so you do need to remember you're working with a very sharp blade. 
Um, actually, this brings in mind a guy who um, is posting a load of health and safety warnings at the moment, uh, and he actually gone a bit overboard. Um, he wanted to, me to warn you that paper could be dangerous, and a lethal paper cut is not an interest, not a nice thing, and that the last thing we made had rotating blades that could chop your head off. I think the guy's gone a bit overboard, eh? But be careful because. These are open blades, and they are sharp. <laughs> Try not to cut your own head off, if possible. So what I do with this thing is just hold it firmly between finger and thumb, put it up against the edge that we're actually going to work with, and use it like a cabinet scraper. So at a slight angle, and push away from yourself, and you'll take off a trimming of all that swarf that we just had, and it'll leave you with a very nice finish. So you get a lovely finish to the edge of the blade and obviously you want to trim those up so that we get some nice blades like that. Now we've got to do exactly the same thing with these. Okay so when I've cut them all out what I do is stack them up, bind them together and then put them in the chop saw again on both edges to make sure that those edges are lined up. That each one of these is exactly the same size as every other one. Now, the reason for that is because with that plywood version that we made, there were two main faults with it, really. One, nothing was square, uh, and so everything was warped and twisting, and that meant we couldn't keep the magnets close to the coil. And two, it was made out of plywood, so it's not going to be particularly weather-resistant. So you need to take a reasonable amount of care to get everything square, so that when we put it together, it isn't going to wobble the way the plywood uh, wood one did. Using plastic, of course, this is um, UPVC meant for outside use. It's got about a 25-year lifespan on it, so they say, and I've heard reports of 40 years. So once you cut that binding, which is just a bit of electrical tape, then you get all your slats nice and square and all the same size. Now, we need to put these in a ring, and, and the ring needs to be relatively large, sort of two foot across, and I was pondering what would be useful for that. Now, sitting on my chair thinking about this thing, when it suddenly clicked on the bottom of the chair, oh, is this thing. This thing actually is made to take a lot of weight. It's made to take the weight of an average person. So it's quite a few kilos that it'll take. So I had some spare ones, and I've collected two of those. The plan here is to put a plastic ring around those. This will be the support. One at top, one at the bottom. So they're essentially like that, spaced apart. A ring on here that will be the carrier for both the blades and the magnets. That will give me a weather-resistant, strong drum. Now, as luck would have it, that central hole fits these perfectly. I got these from a printer and so they're not costing me anything but I guess you could buy these for £10 or so for the pair and you can buy bearings to any size you want. This bearing is 47 millimeters to the internal, 25 millimeters to the internal, external 47, internal 25 and it goes right in there like that. Isn't that awesome? So that will line up and make me my bearing really rather nicely. So the next task we've got to do, now we've got most of our parts together, because to make the drum we've got our support structure that's going to rotate, we've got our bearings, we still need a central axle, we've got our fin blades, and we still need two large rings that can carry those. Hi, so in a previous video we talked about this stuff, which is an aluminium honeycomb structure that I salvaged from smart boards. Now it's an awesome material and I'm lucky to be able to find it and if you can find one of these things you should salvage it because it is just so awesome. And it gives me a rigid structure where I can make those um, ends of the drum that I need to make just by cutting out a piece and marking it up, which is what I've done here. So I've uh, cut a piece 80 by 80 Diagonal, diagonal, give me the centre, and I've used my compass to draw me an 80 centimetre diameter circle. So this thing's going to be 0.8 of a metre across. All I have to do to it is take a jigsaw to it, and then sand those edges to give me that. And I'm going to make two bits like that, which will be the end pieces of my drum. Once we 
we've got two of these massive circles, the chair legs that we took off are going to fix on there. Now, I'm not actually sure if I'm going to put these on the outside so they look kind of spacey, or on the inside so that they're kind of hidden. But we bolt those through, and that, remember, takes the bearing which drops straight in there. Now, here's one that I've done. All bolted up, and I'm wondering if that kind of arrangement would be nice because we drop the bearings in, drill a hole through here, then we put a spacer pipe in there, we'll get a very stable drum, and obviously, once we've done that, these blades will actually slide into that drum like that. So, like I say, I'm not 100% sure if they'll be on the outside like that, either side, or on the inside where they fit together like that. I kind of like both, and I think I'll play with both and see which ones I like. But my next task, obviously, is to saw these off and um, get them bolted down. Okay, so having cut out those massive discs and bolted on my chair legs, what I've got is two massive wheels. So obviously what I need to do now is attach these blades to them. So I'm going to attach the blades actually just by gluing the blades on. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the best way or not, to be honest. But I'm going to glue the blades on, and we'll see how firm it is. If it's firm enough, brilliant. If it's not firm enough, then I'm probably going to put rods in between these here to run upright and tighten the whole thing down. But let's see. Let's put the blades on, and we'll see how strong it is. Okay, so I was going to put the blades in, but actually I thought I'd point out a few more things to you. Now, clearly, what I've done is I've put the basic drum here with an axle on it and on this bench. If I give that a little spin... I mean, that's actually really beautifully balanced, eh? So I've seen what kind of wobble I have on this side by basically sticking a pen on the bench, and then you can judge where that wheel is going in and out as it goes past the pen. If, it, if it's too low, it'll hit the pen and then rise off and hit the pen and so on. So you can actually mark where it's out of true. I've got about half a millimetre out of true. And for something like this, which is, you know, um, blackboard and table legs, Half a millimetre, that is just awesome, actually. Now, I found a bit of 50 mil steel pipe here that I've buried into the table legs so that it gives it good, strong support and keeps those legs out. Because remember, this is where all the force is. Uh, and then, obviously, they splay onto the discs here, and the blades are going to go in the disc. Now, this is coated with a plastic coating, and the blades will glue on there with super glue. And as you can see by these marks, I was thinking of doing that, but then I changed my mind, because this, uh, <laughs> even if I said so myself, this is beautifully made. So I want to make it really strong. So what I've decided to do is I've cut off some little sections of pipe here and I'm gluing the pipe all the way around. What I'll do is drill into the pipe once they're all in place and pour resin in there. The resin will obviously go into that little section under here. Remember this is a honeycomb and fill the pipe up a little bit. So that will make a strong and permanent fixing where I can put the blades onto here, because super glue bonds to this UPVC, which is what this is, and what this is, very, very strongly, remember. It's actually stronger than the original material. So by the time I've made those pipe sections there, then the blades will actually fit in rather nicely into the pipe sections, and I can glue the blades onto the pipe sections and have confidence that the wind won't actually just snap them off. Because this layer of plastic actually turned out to be relatively weak, which was disappointing. But once I get those pipes done, then we're going to have a beautiful fixing there that the wind isn't going to be able to snap those off. So I've got the drum made. I've got it balanced. Obviously, it's a lovely axle. Remember, the drum turns, the axle is fixed. So it's a lovely axle. We're making the blade fittings here out of these pipes, which is what we're going to do. And then we're going to fit the blades once those pipes are done, just by gluing them onto the pipes. So now all the pegs are on, all I've got to do is put a bit of super glue on a peg. Make sure it's the right peg. And then put that on at roughly 36 degrees. And when that's dry, just go around the whole lot doing exactly the same thing. So there it is, with the blades attached. Actually, I'm quite pleased. If I get this a little spin, those bearings are so good. That's just going to spin for ages, actually. So really nicely, freely spinning. And I'm sure you can see how level it is. Like I said, I've tested this, and we're at half a millimetre out. That's a bit awesome. Um, 
So far, I've actually spent uh, two times four ninety-five, whatever that is, nine nine eighteen, seventeen pounds ninety. Uh, no, seven pounds ninety. Sorry, on it so far, and um, that's where we are. Now the book of this is done. All we really need to do with this, remember, with these designs, is stick on the magnets and put the coils underneath. And yes, it's going to need a support structure. But anyway, that's that part done. On with the next bit.